our second panel or our first real panel is uh, on, on democracy and, and nationality um, with three excellent speakers. Um, and with no uh, further ado, I will turn it over to, to Martin Chungong, the Secretary General of the Interparliamentary Union, uh, to give opening uh, comments. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Michael, and uh, uh, to uh, welcome all of you uh, to this uh, uh, panel. Uh, I am very honored and uh, pleased to be uh, part of this conversation on a subject that is very close to my heart. And I must admit that when I was approached to uh, participate in this uh, symposium, I didn't hesitate because uh, I think that uh, we're all engaged in a conversation that is very important. Uh, maybe some people might think that we are immodest in saying that this is critical to the survival of uh, uh, mankind. And uh, I therefore uh, feel honored to be uh, able to moderate this particular uh, segment of the uh, conversation. But if I could just say a couple of words, I do believe many people do adopt uh, an alarmist approach to democracy uh, when you uh, listen to uh, people talking about democracy, they talk about uh, democracy being under threat in jeopardy, uh, threatened in its very foundations. And I tend to look the other way around. I tend to think that uh, democracy uh, has a lot of potential. It is not threatened. It's not going to dis disappear. I'm one of those that believe in the resilience of democracy. And uh, what I uh, tend to say is that democracy is challenged, and that is the beauty of it all. Uh, it is not something that allows for complacency. We, we need to continue to work towards an ideal, a democratic ideal. And if we were to be complacent, then that's when democracy would be in peril. So I do know that there are lots of challenges uh, uh, facing democracy today. Uh, many of those challenges have been uh, eloquently explained in the background documentation we have received here. And during this panel this afternoon, I'm sure that uh, we'll delve into some of the uh, details of those challenges and look at how we could, as a global community, uh, begin to address uh, these issues and uh, make sure that democracy uh, thrives and at the end of the day is relevant uh, to uh, the global and local communities as such. So I'm pleased to moderate a panel of distinguished uh, uh, thinkers. And I, I must say that I am very pleased to be presiding over a gender balanced panel. I, I happen to be uh, the chair of the Global Board of the International Gender Champions, and I am committed to not participating in any discussion where there's no gender equality. And today, I see that uh, we do have that uh, uh, requirement fulfilled here. So thank you very much to you all, to the organizers, and to uh, those who are going to join us in this conversation. We do have Leah Grenfell. If you allow me, I'll just call you by your first name, Leah. Leah, I have read on uh, your, about you, and I see that lots of good things that have said uh, that have been said about you. I do see that you have uh, done a lot of uh, publishing and research on issues of art, economics, history, language, and literature. That's a long list, and not never-ending philosophy, politics, religion, and science, and. What an impressive array of uh, areas of expertise. But I, I, I think that you're well known for your work on nationalism and nationality. And that is why uh, I think the uh, panelists, uh, or rather the organizers, asked you to be part of this discussion so you can talk to us about uh, your perspectives on nationalism and how you see this relating to democracy, whether it enriches democracy or as some people would think, imperils democracy. But uh, we will hear from you. Then we have Manu, Manu Bhagavan. Uh, thank you for, for joining us. And uh, I understand that you're a, histori a historian and uh, author, a prolific one for that matter. Thank you for joining the conversation. And um, uh, we would like uh, to uh, pick your brains on the specific case of India, which uh, is vaunted as the biggest democracy in the world today. And uh, looking at uh, uh, 
the rise of inter internationalism uh, in, the, uh, in the 20th century. Lastly, we have uh, Vivian. Vivian is closer to me here in Geneva. You are, I do understand you're in France. Is that correct, Vivian? Uh, I'm actually on the Italian coast right next to the French border. So I'm uh, between the two, France and Italy. Yes, thank you, thank you, uh, Vivian. You two have an uh, eloquent uh, bi biography and uh, it would be uh, uh, very difficult for me to go through all of this, but uh, I do understand that uh, European integration is uh, something that uh, is very uh, close uh, to, to, to your heart. Uh, and uh, this afternoon we'll be uh, listening to you and I hope that uh, you will be uh, delving into the details of popular, uh, populism, which has been identified as a major uh, threat to uh, democracy and multilateralism uh, today. So uh, we would like to hear from you in that regard. So without uh, further ado, we are going to uh, give the floor to each uh, one of our three uh, uh, presenters to uh, make their case for uh, 20 minutes each. I'm very glad. Uh, to follow uh, immediately upon uh, the um, remarks by Mr. Changong, because like him, I am also not very worried uh, about democracy. Now I don't think that it is in any more peril than uh, it always is. Um, okay. Uh, it was several months into the pandemic that I got the invitation to present at this symposium, which was originally called Democracy Beyond the Nation State. In my opinion, it was a better title for two reasons. One, because rather than drawing attention to various crises of the existing nation state, the pandemic underscored their remarkable resilience vis-a-vis -vis transnational trends and bodies such as globalization and among others the European Union conventionally presumed to spell the nation state's demise. And two, because the original title presupposed a natural connection between the nation state and democracy problematizing democracy beyond the nation state, while the current one rather assumes that the former can well survive outside of the latter. The empirical fact of the strength of the existing national political frameworks vis-a-vis -vis the wobbly transnational infrastructure predicted to replace them aside the theoretical possibility of democracy beyond the nation state can be imagined if both phenomena are clearly, that is both logically and historically understood only to the extent that nationalism, national consciousness, which has historically taken the forms of particular nationalisms, may be territorially unattached. What is important to recognize is that modern democracy, as distinguished from, let's say, the Athenian one, perfectly consistent with slavery, is a product of nationalism, logically implied in national consciousness and inconceivable outside it. This consciousness can, however, exist independently of nationality, that is a particular national identity overwhelmingly concentrated within the borders of a particular nation state. In this sense, one can be a nationalist without being an American nationalist, a French nationalist, or any other particularist nationalist, simply seeing social reality through the lens of nationalism that is, as a sovereign community of fundamentally equal members. Globalists, those who predict and wish for transnational 
global community. Are nationalists precisely of this kind? There may be hundreds of thousands of them around the world, mostly in the West, but national consciousness of billions of human beings is firmly attached to their particular national identities and the nation states home to these identities. Transnational trends are institu uh, and institutions are strong when these billions perceive the common national consciousness behind them and specifically when they are perceived to pursue the interests of many of very powerful nations. They are weak when their nationalism, general and particular, disappears from view. Unfortunately for themselves and their projects, globalists as a rule misunderstand nationalism, are unaware of their own nationalist inspiration and thus present the agenda as opposed to the nationalism of the mass of humanity. What is nationalism and what is its imminent connection to democracy? It is hardly controversial to postulate as the very first step towards understanding nationalism that at the core of it, as a perspective, attitude, sentiment, or ideology, lies the concept of nation. Central to the consciousness of every modern human being, this concept made its first appearance only in the 16th century. The word itself would be completely unfamiliar to the 99.999% of humanity after the fall of Rome. In Rome, it meant litter, as of kittens or puppies something physically born, and no one would refer to one's community as a nation. During the next millennium, the word changed meanings numerous times, being first a derogatory term for immigrants in Rome who were not citizens and were looked down upon as animals. Then in the Middle Ages, when this derogatory connotation was forgotten for communities of foreigners in medieval universities whose student bodies consisted of foreigners, and somewhat later for the parties of factions at the church councils debating the limits to papal authority. These factions were very small, barely a few individuals each, but their debates were of utmost consequence for various late medieval principalities whose interests they represented and their authority as a result enormous. Early in Tudor England, after the Wars of the Roses physically destroyed the English feudal aristocracy and by default set off the process of social mobility from below to fill the places on the top of the social hierarchy, which were vacated, the word nation in its conciliar meaning was made a synonym of the word people, which at the time in all European languages meant plebs or rebel, the lower common classes from which the new English aristocracy was recruited. This created the modern, our concept of nation, nation understood as a people, an inclusive, sovereign community with membership unaffected by divisions of class and status, thus equal and the natural object of the members' loyalty and commitment. Equating nation with people symbolically elevated the lower classes previously regarded as rebel to the dignity of the elite and endowed them with the elite's authority, uniting upper and lower classes in a sovereign community of equals and making all of its members fundamentally interchangeable. The representation of social realities 
in its entirety was transformed. This was the birth of nationalism, a new view of reality, a new form of consciousness, at the core of which lies the idea of the nation. If you examine yourselves, you all will discover that you share in this consciousness and that your social attitudes and your political ideas with the values of equality, liberty, and popular sovereignty at their head directly derive from it. These values are reflected in the core social institutions. Institutions, as already Durkheim pointed out, being basically established ways of thinking and acting, including the central one, the system of social stratification, which regulates social relations across all spheres of our lives. An egalitarian society does not mean an unstratified society or a society in which there are no inequalities. All society are stratified, among other things, because as a matter of fact, all men and women are not created equal. But our empirically unwarranted commitment derived from nationalism to the proposition that they are creates a stratification system that is dramatically different from other stratification systems, a fluid and open one in contrast to ones that are rigid and closed, a system characterized by social mobility. In distinction to closed systems of social stratification, the bear of status in our system of stratification derived from nationalism and called class system is the individual rather than the family and the foundations of status in it, wealth and education are achievement based and therefore transferable between families in distinction to birth or blood relations on which status is based in rigid stratification systems, which are ascriptive and thus cannot be transferred between unrelated families. These characteristic features of the modern system of stratification logically follow from nationalism. The two major modern political institutions, the state and civil society, are also logically connected to nationalism. Today, we tend to use the word state and government as synonyms, but the word state came to refer to government only after the emergence of nationalism and as a new addition to the political vocabulary designated a new form of government. In distinction to kingship, for instance, which is personal government, state government is impersonal. It is always government by officials representing the sovereignty of the people and so essentially a representative government. Combining the fundamental egalitarianism implicit in nationalism and in the first place institutionalized in the modern system of stratification with the principle of popular sovereignty implicit in nationalism and institutionalized in the first place in the state form of government, we are logically led to conclude that nationalism implies democracy, that all nations are by definition democratic societies. However, we are so used to equating democracy, government of the people, for the people, and by the people, with liberal democracy, that in liberal democracies such as ours, this statement is bound to provoke surprise and disbelief. But liberal democracy is only one form democracy takes and there are in the vocabulary of political discourse for this reason, 
also such expressions as social democracy, socialist democracy, as in the Soviet Union or GDR, and popular people's democracy, as in China. Liberal democracy specifically is a democracy implemented in institutions safeguarding individual rights. Yet democracy, a government of the people, for the people, by the people, can be implemented through institutions emphasizing the rights of groups, where the majorities, such as the people or minorities, defined as collective individuals. A collectivistic democracy is not less of a democracy than the individualistic or liberal democracy, but it is surely in many respects a very different, as a rule, authoritarian form of democracy. The distinction between these two forms does not always remain clear for the participants and often in traditionally liberal democracies, the sight is lost of the fact that authoritarian democracies are democracies too. That authoritarianism as such is opposed not to democracy, but to liberalism in its classical individualistic sense of authority dispersed among individuals in the community. And that shifting the emphasis from individual rights to rights of collectives inevitably leads to further blurring of distinctions and may very well result in an emergence of authoritarian institutions. In other words, establishing authoritarian ways of thinking and acting in place of the liberal ones. It appears to me that the perception that democracy is in peril today which lies at the basis of this conference, and which this conference implicitly attributes to the attack of democracy by nationalism, in fact reflects this conceptual confusion and the constant give and take between collectivism and individualism, authoritarianism and liberalism within a democracy itself implicit in nationalism. A major difference between liberal and authoritarian democracies recognized by the term authoritarianism lies in the political activism outside the state or the extent of civil society in them. The values of equality and popular sovereignty in stark contrast to those underlying rigid social stratification and personal government necessarily involve the population in the political process. In every nation, whether liberal or authoritarian, people of all social strata participate in elections, however organized, and referenda, and may ascend to the political leadership. These forms, these forms of participation are connected and feed into the state. Liberal democracies, however, in addition, encourage widespread political activity independent from the state and often organized vis-a-vis -vis it, which may be confrontational as well as cooperative. Direct democracy of New England towns belongs to such activities of civil society as do, among others, the civil rights movement in the United States of the 1960s, feminist and LGBT movements across today's West, and independence movements in Catalonia, Quebec, and Scotland. This is related to the fact that liberal democracies appear far more conflictual than authoritarian ones. The assumptions of fundamental equality of the nation's members and of popular sovereignty endow individual identity in every 
of every national with dignity, enhancing mightily the existential experience of populations in nations. But no man is an island. Therefore, egalitarianism is not conducive to happiness. It invites constant comparison, envy, and competition for dignity, that is for status, for presumed fundamental equality, never corresponds to the actual equality of conditions and condition. In a society of presumed equals, one constantly measures oneself against those who are better off, nurturing a sense either of inferiority or of injustice or often of both at the same time, and never content. In authoritarian democracies, discontent is regulated, channeled outside of the national community, however defined, and otherwise kept under wraps, while political participation is limited and one is encouraged to seek realization in the private sphere. But in liberal democracies, it is public, openly voiced, and for everyone to see. The envy, the competition, the conflict is between individuals or groups within the nation, rather than between the national community and other nations. For this reason, liberal democracies are constantly seething with discontent, constantly under threat of being torn apart by the disaffection of their citizens. They are most content and united only when faced with a formidable existential enemy. The Soviet Union was such an enemy to the liberal West. Nobody, not even China, holds its place today. The question is, can liberal democracy survive without an enemy of this nature. Is Cold War a requirement for us? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Leah. Uh, that uh, presentation is replete with a lot of uh, interesting things. And I, I believe that we're going to come back to some of uh, uh, the emerging issues from the uh, uh, presentation. Uh, may I move on to uh, Manu? Manu, you're going to talk to us about uh, India and internationalism in the, 25, in the 20th century. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary General, and for your earlier kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. I'm grateful to Sam Deese and Michael Holm for organizing all of this and for inviting me to be a part of it. It's my honor to participate in this urgent conversation on, and I'm going to stick with this, the survival of democracy, especially with my distinguished fellow panelists and all of you who are participating virtually. Thanks also to Professor Greenfeld for that stimula stimulating and provocative opening. I think we're gonna find some lines of conversation and clear disagreement. Freedom is in peril. Defend it with all your might. So warned a famous rallying cry in wartime Britain in the, mid in the mid 20th century. This was also inscribed, sorry, I'm just turning on my countdown so that I'm not late. Um, uh, this was also inscribed on the masthead of the National Herald, an anti-colonial newspaper in India launched in 1938 by its soon to be first prime minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, who picked it up from a British cartoon. It is apt for our current moment as well. For all around the world, consolidating authoritarianism labels honest press reporting as fake news, creates violence against those who dissent, and seeks to extinguish the flame of liberty everywhere. From the Philippines to Poland, right-wing populism is on the march to an ever-growing drumbeat of outright fascism itself, and democracies are playing defense. And on the horizon, nuclear conflict and climate apocalypse loom. It is tempting to see our current predicament as the product of happenstance and bad luck, the result of twists of fate in just the last few years. Yet the conditions that allowed for us to get where we are had been laid years before. 
Multinational corporations took advantage of tax loopholes to shelter their assets and deprive states of fair share revenue. Disaggregated chains of production allowed them to weaken or thwart labor and environmental regulations, move jobs from country to country with ease, and sustain a downward pressure on wages. A global corporatism that has fed an unsustainable inequality where a wealthy few hoard grotesque amounts of wealth on their yachts and private jets, while the vast majority suffer from the lack of even basic necessities. Meanwhile, endless war has threatened the well being and physical safety of people everywhere on streets, on strolls, in cafes, in homes, as non-state actors assault civilian life while state-guided missiles and smart bombs collaterally damage anyone in the vicinity of potential suspects. And typhoons, hurricanes, mudslides, tsunamis, and flooding, along with the vector-borne diseases they herald, and now the global pandemic of COVID-19 has caused devastating losses to life, limb, and livelihood. This, while human-driven climate change continues with each passing moment to make matters exponentially worse. Fearful for both their personal and economic futures, people in democracies had turned to their local governments to protect them, yet no single state or even group of states was able to rise to these challenges, for these were, and remain, problems on a planetary scale. And so faith in democracy, its institutions, and its processes the cacophonous din it was meant to corral into conflicted but complementary conversation has correspondingly declined. Simultaneously, our international institutions have also fallen short. The coronavirus has revealed just how thin a prophylactic the World Health Organization's shield actually is easily ruptured. The IMF not only failed to adequately address the Greek debt crisis, it added to it with austerity its internal audit later admonishing its own actions. The International Criminal Court's blinkered prosecutorial focus on Africa to the exclusion of other visible perpetrators triggered continent-wide efforts to withdraw from the Rome Statute, South Africa having led the way. These twin failures of local democratic means of redress and of the liberal international order opened the door for populists and gave a sense of cohesion to their rise. If democratic norms and niceties proved ineffective, the need of the hour was a strong leader who could take decisive action, would be claimants proclaimed. They alone could fix it, they sang in chorus. If our international systems could not make us safe, if the global elite failed us, we must reject them, they said. Once in power, they have since repackaged xenophobia, jingoism, and racism as a defense of, quote, the people, against outsiders who would destroy their host culture, community, and country, leading some observers to dub them the Nationalist International or the League of Nationalists. As French National Front presidential candidate Maureen Le Pen exulted just before her loss to Emmanuel Macron in the last presidential election, we are experiencing the end of one world and the birth of another. We are experiencing the return of nation states. While Le Pen was defeated then, she and others of her ilk are still on the move, thanks in no small measure to instigation from Moscow for ends that are as yet unclear, but likely have to do with the restoration of Russia's pride of place amongst the great powers. India, for its part, has sought to play it safe, embracing the same kind of muscular majoritarian nationalism at home, while nonetheless voicing support for a multilateralist liberal order abroad unwilling or unable to make a clear choice between the two or to think creatively beyond them. In contrast with this lack of imagination, India's anti-colonial pioneers dreamt of a country on the move, in the world, alive with possibility. They brought commitment, energy, and an undeniable zeal for tackling intractable problems to make the impossible possible. The fate of India and that of the global polity they insisted were inextricably linked. As they applied their ideals, they inspired a generation to think and act in new ways, and their insights may well yet offer a pathway out of our current predicament. Beginning in the late 19th century, but drawing from an older well of ideas, visionaries from across the world saw that many of the biggest social issues, poverty, identity, migration, violence, were interrelated and so demanded an integrated set of solutions. Across a wide swath of the political spectrum, internationalists, as they came to be known, 
argued that one had to look at things from a planetary perspective to find the most viable and enduring answers. In the United States, for instance, Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt brought both optimism and determination to bear as they unleashed program after program to help combat the despair of the Great Depression in the 1930s. They profoundly reconfigured the American political economy before FDR declared a universal quest for four freedoms of speech of worship from fear and want. This kind of broad-minded global politics resonated with a wide array of founding figures in the Indian subcontinent who came to similar conclusions on their own terms. Despite disagreements and debate, they found common ground on a substantial set of goals, a belief in collective responsibility for the social good, a sense of justice, a duty to raise up the wretched, and a desire to emphasize shared human dignity. Railing against the quote, cruel epidemic of evil and the warmongering exclusivity at its core, India's poet par excellence, Rabindranath Tagore, argued in the early 20th century that nationalism, contra to um, our earlier presenter, was no solution to the people's ills and instead a cause of them, juxtaposed to an international cosmopolitanism. In his forlorn, soul-stirring way, he concluded with a lyrical warning, quote, the naked passion of self-love of nations, he wrote of the sunset of the century, in its drunken delirium of greed is dancing to the clash of steel and the howling verses of vengeance. The crimson glow of light on the horizon is not the light of thy dawn of peace, my motherland. It is the glimmer of the funeral pyre burning to ashes, the vast flesh, the self-love of the nation, dead under its own excess. Fellow renowned poet wrote a fellow renowned poet, Sarojini Naidu, wrote as early as 1903, quote, it is because that my beloved father said, be not limited even to the Indians, but let, be it, let, but let it be your pride that you are a citizen of the world, that I should love my country. I beg you, my brothers, not to limit your love only to India, because it is better to aim at the sky it is better that your ideals of patriotism should extend for the welfare of the world and not be limited to the prosperity of India and so to achieve prosperity for your country. Such words spoke to Nehru's heart and appealed to his tactile understanding of politics. From the end of the First World War, he sought ways to turn such poetry into political prose. After his initial hopes were raised and then dashed by Woodrow Wilson's 14 points, he found an opening when Mahatma Gandhi began quietly talking about internationalist ideals in the 1920s. The two soon began to exchange ideas, agreeing first and foremost that the imperial order had to be upended, for therein lay the ultimate manifestation, if not the root, of systematic dehumanization, discrimination, and domination. These triple terrors led not only to everyday misery for millions, but also inevitably to violence and to war. I'm at the halfway point here. But the fate of the 14 also revealed a tragic truth. Internationalism in and of itself was no panacea, for it was not inherently anti-imperial. Instead, as the League of Nations willed into being by South Africa's Jan Smuts demonstrated, the two could go hand in hand. Combinations of empires would not and could not alter the ideologies and ambitions that were hardwired into their constituent units, making such an organiza organization an ineffective instrument of peace. The League's failure to prevent the outbreak of World War II proved this point as much as it revealed the need for all, including the great powers, to be included in a functional international union. That internationalism did not inherently serve as the negation of imperialism did not that it could not. For Gandhi, the takeaway was obvious, and here a, a bit of uh, agreement with the Professor Greenfeld. Internationalism is possibly only when nationalism becomes a fact, when people belonging to different countries have organized themselves and are able to act as one man. But for this to be true, the type of nationalism mattered, as did the type of internationalism that followed. This meant that, quote, narrowness, selfishness, and exclusiveness all had to be rejected and expunged, 
As with all other things, for Gandhi, the way one traveled to a destination determined the nature of the arrival and where one might be able to go thereafter. Writing in July 1942 to a prominent disciple, Gandhi proclaimed, quote, I was trying to take everybody towards World Federation. I want free India too for that purpose. If, power of, if the power of nonviolence is firmly established, the idea of empire dissolves and a world state takes its place in which all the states of the world are free and equal. Just weeks later, the Indian National Congress committed the anti-colonial movement to this ideal in the Quit India Declaration. In the wake of World War II, India formally adopted the creation of, quote, one world as its grand strategic objective, a world government with all its requisite organs for executive, deliberative, and judicial functions where the absolute sovereignty of each nation will have to undergo an agreed upon modification. The term came from Wendell Wilkie, which I've written about elsewhere. Progressive internationalism was, pre was premised on the principle that free people everywhere should determine their future together under the aegis of forged common ideals. Difference and the will of the locality had to be respected, speaking to our opening presentation, um, opening keynote. Under the proviso that neither could serve as an excuse to oppress, Gandhi explained that individual, national, and international inter independence were all interconnected, and one could not have one without the others, each limited only by the legal maxim to, quote, not use what you have to harm others. Um, this is what led Indians to embrace the new concept of human rights, then in gestation. In parallel with decolonization and as part of it, India understood such rights as a way to embody the basic values that all societies shared, essential for the common good. Each right carried with it an attendant obligation. So every person, every people, and every state had a range of duties to one another, inflecting the protections all were guaranteed. Madam Vijay Lakshmi Pandit and Hansa Mehta helped shape the formal UN instruments with this in mind. As an aside, I'm in the midst of writing a biography of Madam Pandit, who was Nehru's sister and was once one of the most famous and feted women in the world. She was in India's ambassador to Moscow, the US, the UK, and the UN. It is perhaps fitting uh, to point out in this forum that few others did more or had more success to forge global amity and positive Indo-US relations than she. For nearly two decades, India advanced this agenda with tenacity, though of course not without domestic and international setbacks and inconsistencies. The country's idealism was practically mitigated by a sense of real politique, shaped in part by Nehru's Fabian socialism, Fabianism. India saw the big picture, but also approached each, each constituent situation clear-eyed. Compromise that validated opponents while not betraying principles was essential to progress and small achievements were to be celebrated. A liberal international order took the, took the place of the imperial regime coinciding with its demise and centered on the nation state. But for India, this was not at odds with its goals since decolonization and self-determination were seen as fundamental elements and preconditions for functional global government. The liberal order was a step in the right direction. Indian leadership attracted admirers from all over, from eccentrics like first world citizen Gary Davis to eminence grise like Albert Einstein. Arnold Toynbee, who had achieved renown for his grand study of history, traveled to India in 1960 to deliver the first Azad Memorial Lectures at the Indian Council for Cultural Relations, a year after Nehru inaugurated them. Introduced along with the prime minister as quote, citizens of a world state which is not yet in being, Toynbee pointed to what he called India's characteristic, quote, fabulous variety in unity as, quote, the only alternative to mutual destruction. He brought his talk to an end, reflecting the Catholicity of the Malana for whom his talk was named. We have not merely to appreciate our neighbors' distinctive contributions, he affirmed. We have to love our neighbors themselves as precious members of a human family. But the Cold War created an impenetrable cloud of confusion and paranoia. Suspicion bred more suspicion until finally mistrust between a polarized world restricted and then smothered any opportunity to forge stronger bonds. 
the 1962 Sino-Indian War was but one symptom of the malaise, after which India abandoned the high road. For its, for its descent, um, from its descent, it has never regained the standing it once held. India's turn away from its former positions following the Chinese incursions was not a sharp immediate reversal, uh, but rather a gradual one. The country continued to work within international frameworks like the non-aligned movement to build regional cooperatives like SARC to stand apart from the superpowers, though now in service of much diminished aims. It jettisoned its larger dream of one world and started to take more hardline aggressive positions, embracing a perceived new realism. Nonetheless, India never retired its high-minded talk either, and the result has been a growing gap between rhetoric and action, the country's hollowed out moral proclamations betraying the bigger strategic vacuum. Yet, the world is now in crisis, and both nationalism and the existing liberal order have fallen short in addressing our underlying distress and have, in their own ways, in fact, exacerbated manners, matters. And so perhaps it is time to think anew about India's unfulfilled internationalist vision of a world governed by political and civil liberties, as well as economic, social, and cultural rights, of a world that celebrates differences of custom and community within such norms, and that empowers people at both the local and the global levels. Keep watch, India, Tagore implored, be not ashamed to stand before the proud and the powerful with your white robe of simpleness and know that what is huge is not great and pride is not everlasting. Perhaps the key to the success of rightist rhetoric over the last several years has been the underlying appeals based on nostalgia. Leavers in Britain promised a restoration of British glory. Trump wants to make America great again, again. These gauzy representations of the past summon a simpler time, imagined simultaneously as one of tremendous power and achievement. The allure of nostalgia is great, a siren song so seductive that none see the danger until their dreams have been dashed upon the rocks. How do we hear this song and yet have our ship sail right past as Odysseus did to defeat the sirens and end their reign of terror? Populist nostalgia is about the reconstruction of past systems. The way to counter it is to offer people a path to a more hopeful, positive future, to reassure them that we hear their concerns and that we can effectively address their needs, to give them something to live for. From another era of darkness, it is Nehru who lights a beacon for us to catch fire in our time and to show us the way forward. The future beckons to us, he said. Whither do we go and what shall be our endeavor to bring freedom and opportunity to the common man? to the peasants and workers to fight and end poverty and ignorance and disease and to create social, economic and political institutions which will ensure justice and fullness of life to every man and woman and pledge ourselves to cooperate with the peoples of the world in furthering peace, freedom and democracy. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, Manu for that very insightful uh, presentation. I'm sure that uh, when Vivian takes the floor, she may want to address some of the issues uh, related to uh, popularis uh, populism uh, as uh, it relates to uh, uh, democracy. And uh, uh, I, I think that one uh, major point you, you were making, Manu, or rather one question you were raising is uh, whether uh, uh, you know, uh, internationalism as we see it today uh, is uh, in a position to resolve uh, the major global challenges that are facing the global community today. And this brings us to the discussion about uh, pushback on multilateralism, uh, which is uh, seen to be failing in the, in the face of many of the crises that we are facing today. So we'll come back to that. Uh, Vivian, uh, may I now call on you to, uh, uh, talk to us about uh, the populist challenge to liberal democracy in Europe and North America. Yes, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Martin, for your uh, lovely introduction. Thank you, Richard, um, and others for the invitation. And so I'm going to follow up a bit on both Leah and Manu um, and focus in on the populist challenge to liberal democracy. 
but to connect their topics to mine, I'd just like to add that I think what we're in is a crisis of legitimacy for liberal democracies. So I think about um, legitimacy in two ways. One is a governing authority of, of governing bodies. So this is about public consent uh, and trust in a governing bodies. And that's a kind of traditional Weberian sense. But there's another way to think about legitimacy and that's in terms of governing activities and the way in which they may re reinforce or undermine governing authority. Uh, and here I'm thinking of three specific ways. One is in terms of um, policy performance. We often think about this about economics, but it's not necessarily just that. Um, one could also think about things like climate change or whatever, but, um, uh, and rise in inequality. Another is governance procedures. And this is about issues of accountability, transparency, openness, inclusiveness, but one can add also a technical term of efficacy. And finally, in terms of the legitimacy of governing activities, of course, it's about the politics. It's political legitimacy. And that's not only citizen representation and participation, but also political responsiveness. And this probably speaks to a bit of what Leah was talking about um, in terms of democracy, liberal democracy, and authoritarian democracy, although I have difficulty with the term democracy linked to authoritarianism. But responsiveness um, is, I think, is also a key part of the legitimacy of governing activities. And to my mind, if we ask why the rise of populism today, in many ways, it's the failure of governing bodies' uh, legitimacy in terms of their activities. Um, that is undermined. So legit legitimacy has been undermined in this way um, by governance failures and has fueled the rise of populism as a major challenge to liberal democracy. So um, when we think about today's rise of populism, it's about how populist politicians have been able to channel uh, citizens' angers. And they use, may use different languages, but they have similar messages. It's anti-migration, it's anti-open borders, anti-globalization, anti-free trade. And in Europe, it's against the European Union or against the Euro. Um, but they're the same range of sources. It's the economics of those feeling left behind. It's the sociology of those worried about the quote unquote changing faces of the nation. And it's the politics of those who want to take back control. We see similar rhetorical strategies uh, a kind of uncivil language in post-truth environments that reject experts um, and that frame the debates in new ways using both new media but also uh, exploiting the old media. And I guess our question would be, is this an existential threat to political and economic liberalism? And perhaps here, and, and I'm back with Leah on this, there may be more of a threat from populist nationalism on the extremes of the right than the kind of economic populism that we often see on the extremes of the left. Um, but of course, these populist challenges to liberal democracy are everywhere, in particular in Europe, on the right-wing populist extremes, Marine Le Pen, Geert Wilders, the Lega Nord, um, the True Finns, um, obviously in Finland, Vox, in Spain, Hungary and Poland call themselves illiberal democracies, but here again, maybe they're just illiberal and maybe less and less democracies, certainly Hungary. Um, and in the US, we can certainly talk about Trump as a populist, and we might add increasingly the Republican Party here. Uh, not to mention various alt-right um, groups, uh, militias, proud boys, etc. But that's a description. How do we explain the rise of populism? Why now? Why in these ways with these effects? And essentially there are no simple answer, answers and many explanations. Um, it's the economy stupid, it's the cultural backlash, it's citizen politics or political institutional failure. It's the crisis figures. Uh, academics have actually talked and written books 
about each and every one of these, often se separating them out, with some focusing on the one, others on the other. But of course, we still don't know why and how unless we consider key features of what I would call the rhetoric of discontent. We need to look at populist leaders' ideas and their discourse. It's about the people versus elites and the experts. It's populist discursive processes, the way they use the new media, or the way in which this translates into activist networks, and the way they also use the traditional media. And we also need to think about populist policies. And essentially, when they're out of power, they're very strong on anti-system complaints, and perhaps they're weak on policies. But what about when they're in power? And also, think about the effect of populists on mainstream parties when they're out of power. So now what I want to do is look more deeply, perhaps, into, um, in, into the very sources of discontent and then move on to populist strategies. Um, the economic sources of discontent. And here we need to talk about the ideational drivers of the economic policies. And it seems to me that Manu has actually referenced a number of these. It's the resilience of neoliberal or ordo liberal ideas, um, where we've moved from free market, uh, free trade and market liberalism to financial capitalism and ultimately to hyper globalization. And we've seen the economic results, the rise of inequality, the 1% in control of major resources of the world, the increases in poverty. Um, and what happens to the people, to the losers of globalization, the people feeling left behind? We see middle class worries about their jobs and their status. Um, you look at the service economy and mini jobs everywhere, the platform or gig economy, and that we see across, in particular, uh, the West, or if you want, the US and, Nor and, and, and Europe, which is really my focus here. And so, but you know, with this focus on the economics, the question is, if it's all about economics, why do we see the rise in populism in Central Eastern European countries or Sweden, which underwent economic booms, even as the financial crisis was hitting? And why do we not see all of this earlier in the 80s or 90s as globalization was taking uh, wing? And of course, as economic in income inequalities were increasing, both in the US and in Europe. So it can't just be the economics. We need also to look at the sociological sources of discontent. And here it's about the sociocultural populist back backlash. Again, I think Leah and Manu have mentioned these. Nostalgia for a lost past. Fear of the other. The anti-immigration and nativist resentments. Um, the anger against others cutting in the line. You know, build a wall as the chants go. Um, and feeling that national identity and sovereignty are under siege. Beyond this, people feel threatened by changing demographics. Here we're obviously talking about um, mainly white males, older, less educated, but there are also intergenerational shifts, post-materialist values. The question is still, why now? You know, after all, this is nothing new. Carl Schmitt uh, talked about this at length, about the fear of the other and the use of this in terms of nationalism. Uh, and Leah has obviously talked about this at, at great length earlier. Uh, and we have to ask, why so acute in some countries and not in others? But then political sources of discontent are also very, very important. People's feeling a loss of trust, a loss of control, certainly in Trump's America and in Brexit in the UK. Uh, in the US, we see massive polarization, red states versus blue states. In Congress, the House versus the Senate and the President. Um, in, the, in the EU, in, Euro, in the European Union, which is a kind of what I call a supranational uh, region state, uh, this links to what Leo was saying, you know, we had the city states of the past, then we developed the nation state of, of you know, not to, of, of the recent period. And actually the EU is something I call a supranational region state which contains nation state become member states in its nest. 
in, any, in, its midst, in any case, here we see a different kind of phenomenon. We see politicization at the bottom, at the national level, with increasing cross-cutting cross cleavages, cosmopolitanism versus communitarianism, um, other words for this. But we also see politicization from the bottom up, that is, from the national level to the EU level, and of course, at the top amongst the various EU actors, amongst member state leaders in the council versus the technical uh, leaders, the technocratic leaders in the commission and European Central Bank, etc. cetera. Um, so there are other political sources of discontent and this is about political institutions that have become seeming remote um, and, and favoring the rich and big business we also see mainstream parties hollowed out. Uh, we see um, also that mainstream parties over the past numbers of years uh, have seemed to privilege responsibility uh, over responsiveness. Um, and with Tweedledee Tweedledum policies, you know, in particular economic policies uh, in the midst of globalization. Um, we also see technocratic depoliticization, more and more policies decided by technocrats. This is essentially the neoliberal trend, independent agencies to make decisions that were formerly made by politicians because as neoliberals would say, we can't trust those rent seeking politicians. But this takes politics and policy out of the hands of the people in some sense. So again, the question is, okay, if it's all about politics, why now? Some people might argue, well, it's about trigger events and the role of crises, financial, the financial crisis, the Eurozone sovereign debt crisis, the refugee and migration crisis in Europe in 2015, Brexit, which is essentially a crisis itself, but also triggers uh, increasing populism elsewhere. The US election, 2016. There's also the psychology of populist post truth. And that's about lies and exaggerations. Uh, you know, think about Trump talking about what I do is think big. People like that. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's sort of hyperbole as a way of, um, of, of, of leading, if not outright lies. Um, and, and the problem with hyperbole, hyperbole it leaves the impression, or lies also, um, it leaves the impression that large numbers are involved, even if they're not as high. So think about Brexit and the attempt to, to push back against the, you know, the red bus with lies on uh, how much was being spent, could be spent on the National Health Service instead of the EU. Uh, if you say it's not nearly that big a number, well, it's still a large number. Um, populist visual process. I think my favorite, is one that the Northern League did in 2009, and it had a Native American, an Indian, in headdress. And the cut line was, they too were subject to immigration, and now they are on reservations. You know, incredibly clever, you know, sort of twisting political correctness around. So I think this is all very important to see that in some ways, the sort of the populist extremes, in particular on the extreme right, very cleverly been able to create a discourse that resonates with people. And of course, there's more than this. How do the populace manage to survive? How do, how do they find one another? This is about the new social media. The new media are valuable, invaluable to the networks of dissent. Clearly, we all know now about Facebook posts that create echo chambers of support. Um, people get their news, fake and real, more from French posts than the actual news media. Um, and populist themselves, there are lots of studies that suggest they rely much, much more on the new media, on, on YouTube and blogs, in addition to Twitter and Facebook, than traditional parties. Um, and these new media, of course, fa facilitate transnational networks. They can find one another in the way, in a way in which it was much harder than in the past. So, but it's not just virtual networks, it's also physical. Think about Steve Bannon going to Europe to try to create um, alt-right in Europe and to bring the various populist um, 
extreme right groups together. You know, the good news is for Europe is these extreme right, right groups don't agree. Um, you know, the Lega in Italy has a very different set of interests about how to deal with migration than say Hungary does in other Central European countries. So hard to bring them together. That's the good news, at least for Europe, not so much for the, for the US. And actually, you know, there's also the use of traditional media. Um, populist leaders have been incredibly successful in using the tradi traditional media to amplify the social media messages. Just think about the way in the US, the traditional media, CNN, MSB, NBC, are the ones who take up Trump's tweets every day um, and, and, and essentially uh, transmit them to the larger population. There's just been a study suggesting that's been much, much more effective than Russian bots. Um, media communication also benefits, of course, messaging. Short news cycles mean that 30 second sound bites give you simpler messages. That favors populists as well. Um, what about populists in power? I think I may be running out of time. I think if you think about populists in opposition versus populists in power, in many ways they tend to be have an ideologically thin discourse. It's more lists about grievances. And many people before populists were elected, and so we're talking in the last five years, many people said, yeah, but they don't really have any policies. Well, actually what we've seen is once they do gain power, they do have policies. In some cases, they may compromise, and I think about Greece, um, Syriza, but in many cases, not. And what we, and you know, think about Hungary. And this is, and what happens when, 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 when you get populists in power, um, democracies die at the hands of elected political leaders who can subvert democratic pro processes that brought them to power. This is Steve Levitsky and Dan Ziblett, but lots of people have talked about the way in which there can be very much a slide into authoritarianism um, once, uh, once populist leaders get elected. I think my last comment will be that we still need to differentiate populisms, and that also may have to do with institutional differences matter. The institutional strength of the US in the economic crisis actually proved it weakness in the political crisis. Um, Trump wins. Uh, in the US, it's very hard, but then he can take over the institutions of government. In the EU, where you don't have an EU level government, but you have national governments that are much more important, what we see is um, this is the strength, institutional weakness in the economic crisis is its strength in the political crisis. Because no central government means no populist can take over the, common, uh, over the continent. And I think I've just run out of time. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very uh, insightful and thought-provoking presentations.